our new teaching series, Choose Your Crazy, you are going to learn how to do something you think you already know how to do. But if no one's ever taught you, you may think you know how to do it, but you don't. And here's Jerry. Hi, good morning. good morning. So starting today and for the next few weeks, um, as Jess said, I want to try to teach you something that you think you already know how to do. Uh, but if no one's ever taught you how to do it, um, like I said, you probably think you know how, but you don't. And uh, I know that sounds crazy, but that's why we're calling this Choose Your Crazy. So um, you get to find out about that. So what I'm going to do for the next three or four weeks is I want to teach you how to be generous. I want to teach you how to be generous, not, not how to give, okay? Everybody knows how to give. Everybody gives something somewhere. Uh, we, we, we do that. This is, a, this is a be thing, how to be generous as opposed to something that you, that you do. And, and I, I don't want to get you to try to do anything, in fact. So you can take the pressure off right there. I don't, I'm not going to try and challenge you to do anything, but I do want to teach you over the next few weeks how to be generous, how to be generous. And uh, uh, as soon as I say that, uh, I already know what some of you are thinking, whether you're here or you're watching online, because I'm the same way. As soon, someone, as soon as somebody says that I don't do something, I immediately think of that one time that I did it, you, you know, and I go, yeah, I, I did it, you know, and, and so I got all that. But uh, so I'm not talking about giving. I'm not talking about random acts of giving. Uh, in fact, generosity, one of the things we're going to learn, generosity is more than just random acts of, of giving. Most of us are really good at random acts of giving, okay? I guarantee you this. In fact, I know this church and I know you people. If today I would say, listen, we have a family in our church has a great financial need right now, and I know I didn't tell you ahead of time, but uh, if you would put extra in the offering today to help, that will go specifically to this family. We've had to do that before, and you guys have just, it's just incredible, you, you know, because some of you already give, and then you just say, well, I'm going to give on top. You, you had no idea when you showed up, and it's just a random act of giving. Random acts usually come as a result of, of uh, somebody persuading us to do something, someone asking us to do something, someone inspiring us to do something. Maybe in the past you've, uh, you've given because someone guilted you into doing something. Uh, but the truth is that most of our random acts of giving come at the end of a little bit of a sales pitch. G generally me or someone else or, you know, wherever you're hearing, whether it's on TV or somewhere else, someone makes a need known we say, yeah, I should do something about that, and I'll give something. I'll give something. So random acts of giving. But what we're going to talk about in this series is not random acts of giving. Uh, now, I'm all for it, okay? I, I do it. I get emotional. You know, someone makes an appeal, and I, I do all those things. But for the next few weeks, I want to talk specifically about generosity and how you can become a generous person. Uh, I really think, and I've said this before, other than telling you about Jesus and about salvation and following the path that Jesus has for you, this may be one of the best things I will ever teach you. One of the things that, that, that has the potential to have the most impact in your life. If, you're a, if you have kids to have an impact in their life is this thing of generosity. Because generosity actually goes way beyond inspiration. It goes way beyond someone guilting you to do something. Genuinely generous people are not moved near as much by some big inspirational, you know, push or some need that's somewhere in the world, uh, nor are generous people never moved by guilt because generous people have moved beyond that, all right? And I want to make a promise to you, and I'm going to remind you of this every week, all right? I'm going to make, this is a personal promise, all right? When you become more generous, three things, you'll give more, and here's the surprise part, that's why you need to come back next week, you'll save more, you'll actually save more money as you become more generous, and you'll consume less. You'll consume less, okay? So as you become generous, and I, like I said, this is my promise to you. You'll give more, you'll save more, and you'll consume less. So generous people, people who have learned to be generous, those people give more, they save more, they consume less. And I also want you to know right off the top that generosity has very little to do about money. I know people get nervous when, when preachers talk about money. And it's really funny because we don't get nervous when anyone else talks about money. I go to the grocery store every week, 
and they always talk about money. And I never go, I can't believe you guys are talking about money again. You know, every place I go, but people get nervous at church. I don't know why. Um, Again, generous people don't get nervous, so uh, no big deal. That has little to do with the amount of money. Uh, You can have a lot of money. You can have a lot of stuff. You can even write big checks to the church, but it doesn't mean you're generous. really has nothing to do with it. And and if you learn to be a generous person, like I said, you'll actually give more, but you'll save more of your own money, And, and you'll actually consume less. And then there's a promise that Jesus makes on top of the promise that I made you. Jesus says, and we'll see this in the series here, that if you become a generous person, you'll be happier. Now that comes from Jesus. You may not have believed my promise, but you got to believe his. Because here's the thing. You in your life have never met an unhappy, generous person. You've never met an unhappy, generous person. Now, the reason this has to be taught is even though we all think we know already, we all think we know how to generous, be generous, is because generosity is not natural. It just isn't natural. If you have children, you know this. You have to teach your children to share, don't you? <laughs> you have to teach them to share. There, there's a lot of things that come naturally, but generosity is just not one of them. There's still something within us that when it comes to giving away what's ours, giving away something that we feel that we've, that we've worked for, that is just not natural. And, and, so, and that's not your fault. You're not alone. It's not natural. And in the United States and, and, and in some Western countries, generosity, even though it's not natural, is actually cultural. And, and the reason that idea of being generous in the United States is, is because in any nation of the world, where in the history of that nation, there's been a history of Christian influence, you'll find in that nation a shadow of some Christian values. Even though they may not consider themselves a Christian nation now, you'll see a shadow of those Christian values. And one of the Christian values is generosity. And we have these, what I call American oughts, O-U-G-H-T-S, American oughts. You know, we feel like as Americans, when a need is presented, that we ought to give. You know, and we ought to be generous. But I want you to know it's not natural. So if it kind of rubs you the wrong way, that's fine if there's some friction there. But it is cultural, and it needs to be taught. So generosity is not natural. It can be cultural, and that's why there's some tension around generosity in our country, because all of us know what we ought to, what we ought to, okay? But it doesn't come naturally. We live in a nation where, fortunately, it's still a part of our American ought. And I hope that in all the things we've lost as a nation, we never lose that, the thing of being generous, all right? Now, if you want to know what normal is when it comes to money, if you want to know what natural is when it comes to money, here you go. Crazy is normal, all right? And we're going to be talking about that the next few weeks. Crazy is natural. Crazy is natural when it comes to money, especially in our country. And this is so amazing to me. I mean, think about this. Do you realize that most Americans spend more money than they make? You realize that, don't you? You know about credit and you know about, (laughs) you know, percentages and stuff like that. I was watching the thing the other day on on the credit thing, and this guy said if all he did was pay back the minimum, in other words, what he owed, it would take him like 46 years to pay off his Bank of America card or something, you know. Uh, But but it's something that we do, and most Americans spend more than they make, and and you're going to hear this word a lot. That's crazy. That's crazy, all right? And not only that, but most Americans pay interest on things that decrease in value the moment they take possession of them, all right? Uh, Most Americans pay interest on items that as soon as they take possession of them, the value of that item immediately decreases, but because they're paying interest, the price immediately increases, okay? And, And I don't think we have any new car salesmen in here right now. I could apply this to all kinds of things, but I've got caught on this. I used to be, got to have a new car every two years, you know. My dad taught me that. And, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> thanks, Dad. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, the car's this much, and as soon as you drive it off the lot, it decreases in value, but because I've got to pay all that interest, the price goes up. You with me? And, and the same thing with, with the house, and the same thing with, 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 with all of these other things that we buy on credit. So you have this timeline of the moment of purchase, the cost increases and value decreases. So again, let me say, that's crazy. And yet we do it. The cost increases and the value decreases. And we live in a culture, though, where this is normal or we think it's normal. We think it's normal, but it's crazy. 
Here's something else as we're laying a foundation. We don't feel rich, but we are. We don't feel like we're rich. If I was to go up, each and every one of you in here, hey, are you rich? Every one of you would say no. But we really are. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you fly over to a third world country and you pick up a husband and a wife and, and two kids, okay? And you bring them back here and they land at the Orlando airport or the, the new, or excuse me, Daytona airport and you take them to your car and you say, oh yeah, we need to stop and get some groceries on the way home. So you stop at Publix or wherever it is that you, that you shop and you take them up and down the aisles of that and you buy your food and then you get back in the car and you pull into your neighborhood and you pull down your, your street and you pull into your driveway and you open your front door and you let them walk in uh, and look around. Listen, you drop someone from most countries in the world into your life right now and they would listen to you and I complain about the financial pressure we feel, and you know what they would say about us? You're crazy. You're crazy. Look at all you have. Look at all that you have. So if generosity is not random acts of kindness, then what is it? And what do I mean by generosity? So here's what I'm going to do today, all right? I'm going to give you four myths about um, generosity, things that we've all heard. Then I'm going to give you a definition. And then we're going to look at one thing that Jesus said, and we're just going to look at one verse this week as the foundation for our series, and we'll jump off there, all right? So four myths about generosity. First one's this, is that generosity is spontaneous. Generosity is spontaneous. You know, you go somewhere, you hear something, you come here at church, I share a need, and you give, and you give. And here's what's really true. Generous people are actually less spontaneous, Generous people are actually less spontaneous. Generous, generous people are actually less emotional in their giving. Generous people are far more strategic in their giving. Okay, so myth number one, generosity is spontaneous. Myth number two, generosity is determined by cash flow. All right, cash flow. In other words, you know what? I got paid so I can be generous today. But two days from now, I, <laughs> I can't be generous. You understand what I'm saying? So it's the amount of cash that I have on hand. I just got paid so I can be generous, but at the end of the month, I can't be generous. The, the myth is that somehow generosity or a person's ability, your ability to be a generous person is determined by, by your cash flow. But here's what the truth is. Generous people are consistently generous. Generous people, their generosity is not determined by their cash flow. So if you're one of those people who say, I give when I can afford to give and I don't give when I can't afford to give, chances are you're a giver, but you haven't learned to be generous. And that's why I want to teach you this over the next three or four weeks. Generosity myth number three, it's the amount that counts. This one drives me crazy. But I always smile because sometimes you smile to not be rude. You ever done that? You just, you just smile just to not be rude. But you've probably heard this one. Someone will say, that was such a generous gift. Or she made such a generous gift. And I'm thinking, no one knows if that was a generous gift except the person who made it. No one knows that. I mean, the only person that knows if the gift is generous is the person that made it. Being able to add zeros to the amount doesn't necessarily show that the amount was generous. It may be a lot of money compared to the amount of money that I have. It may be a lot of money compared to the amount, that you ha the amount of money that you have. But one of the ways we fool ourselves into thinking that we're generous is by looking at the amount of money. And what we're going to learn over the next few weeks like I said, is that money has very little to do when it comes to generosity. And the amount doesn't count because giving is just a part of a person's overall financial picture. And the only way to know whether or not a gift was generous is to know everything about that person's finances. And nobody knows everything about someone else's finances, okay? So here's the great news. That means everybody can be generous because the amount's not what matters. Okay, gener generosity myth number four is this. Uh, only rich people are generous. Only rich people are generous. You know, Jerry, I get it. You're a pastor. You, you got to talk about stuff like this. It's in scripture. It's really good. And when I become rich, okay, I've had so many people say, I'm really trying to win that lottery because I will tithe. And, and I go, not if you're not tithing now, you won't. <laughs> 
You know, you're not, you're not going to do that now. I'll become generous when I get rich. So let me clear this up. Rich people are rich. Generous people are generous. And there's no natural correlation between the two. Okay? No natural correlation between the two. And let me just predict something for you guys that are here in your 20s, 30s, 40s maybe. If you're not generous now with what you have, then when you do in life progress and get better job and more pay and, and all of this, um, you'll just be a rich person who's not generous then if you're not generous with it now. Because there's no correlation between being rich and being generous and two are completely different things. And this is one of the best things my parents ever taught me was how to give when I was a little kid. Okay? Uh, they didn't say wait until you get a job and wait until you do this. When they would give me money, my parents would teach. Instead of giving me a dollar bill, they would give me 10 dimes. Your parents ever do that to you? Because a dime goes to the church. Instead of giving me $10, they'd give me 10 ones. And they'd say a dollar goes to church. And, that, and I know that's tithe and that's not necessarily generous. But I'm just saying my parents taught me that. And my parents taught me to give over and above and, and to, to, to be generous. But again, as your pastor, I, I want you to learn to be generous. And, and it has to be taught because it's not natural. It's not natural. But I want you to know that everybody, everybody in here, everybody watching, regardless of your income level, can be a generous person. All right? So that's what I want for you. So I said I'd give you four myths and I'd give you a definition. So here goes. I want to give you a definition of generosity that we're going to use throughout this series. Um, and, and the next couple of weeks, we're going to take it apart. But here's what I mean when I talk about learning to be generos generous. Here's what generosity is. Generosity is the premeditated. Okay? When you premeditate something, you got a plan. Okay? You got a plan. It's not spontaneous. Generous people have a plan. It's the premeditated, calculated, okay? Generous people already know how much they're going to give, all right? So it's the premeditated, calculated, designated, generous people have predecided where it's going to go, where it's going to go. Emancipation of your money. So what I'm going to teach you, if you want to break it down, someone says, what did you learn at church yesterday? <laughs> I learned how to set my money free. I learned how to set my money free. Okay, you get to set something free. Generous people understand that in order to not be possessed by their possessions, generous people understand that when they order their lives around generosity, they're setting free personal assets, uh, excuse me, financial assets uh, of these things. And here's the thing, and here's what I want you to know. When you free your money, you free yourself from your money. When you free your money, when you make the choice. See, right now, I remember a time, and I'll probably share this with you during the thing, and some of you have, have heard it before. There was a time my wife and I were very, 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 very much in debt. So much when I tell you the amount, you'll go, oh, you know, I can't believe he did that. Uh, I wasn't free from my money, you, you know. But when I learned to, to set it free, then I became free from my money. I know some very wealthy people who worry about their money all the time. They're not free from their money. They're wealthy. It might be considered rich. And I've met some day-to-day -day people who live joyfully because their money doesn't control them. They're free. All right? Let me tell you, financially, you want to be free. You don't want to be a slave to your money and your finances. So today, as we begin this series... Like I said, I want us to look at one verse of Scripture as a starting point. It may be, if I was to just ask ahead of time, what's the most well-known Scripture in the Bible about money? Some of you would have to think for a while, but you'd probably come up with this. And if you didn't, if someone did it and said it out loud, you'd go, yeah, that's it. That's the one I was thinking of. But you weren't able to get it. And here's a surprise. All of you have heard this one before. Most of you have said this before. But I'm betting the biggest percentage of you didn't, don't know that the verse that we're going to talk about is in the New Testament, and you don't know that Jesus said it, and you don't even know why it's in the Bible to begin with, but again, that's where we're going during the series. In fact, I would say that this little scripture that I'm going to share is so popular uh, that it's almost like a cliche now. It's almost like something that's lost its meaning. It's almost like any pastor or any teacher that gets up and talks about finances kind of throws this out there and you just kind of half listen because, yeah, I know. I know the first three words, so, you know, I know the rest of it. I get it. I would say this is something that Jesus said that's been so redefined that we completely miss what Jesus said, uh, meant when he said it. 
You find this thing that Jesus said, actually we're going to find it in the book of Acts. Paul's going to talk about it. We all know about Paul. Paul did not start out as a believer, very much anti this new uh, movement, uh, became a believer in Jesus Christ, went all around the Mediterranean Sea area, and we get to this particular place. He's in the city of Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. That's who he wrote the letter to. A city on the coast of the sea in Greek, and, and he's on his way back to Jerusalem, and we know what happens in Jerusalem. He's going to be arrested, all right? And, and he knows that the people in Ephesus will probably never see him again. And it's one of the most emotional pieces of writing when you read Ephesus in all of the New Testament because Paul begins to list his friends and say goodbye to his friends. I mean, he knows he's never going to see him again. He knows how this is going to end up. And he says goodbye to his supporters. And in this little narrative, this little story in Acts chapter 20, he begins to talk to them about what he's taught them, about what he's done for them, and uh, what he's done with them. And he talks about his generous life, how God's enabled him to be a generous person. And when you read it, he's not bragging. He just says, here's what's happened. Here's what's happened. And it's all because of God. And he tells them that when he's gone, he says, this is the way you need to live, the way that God wants me to live and the way that he wants you to live. And then he throws out this statement that, again, was so familiar to them that he didn't have to say to them, this is something Jesus said. It was so familiar to them that when he said it, they said, yes, we've heard this before. And, 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 but they understood what Jesus, they didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said it. Whereas for us, like I said, it's become almost a cliche. That it's something we say every time we feel good about giving a gift. So here's what Paul writes. And then I want us to spend a little bit of time looking at this because this is such a powerful idea. And it really sets the attention for the rest of this series. So he's at the end of the writing he, he's saying his farewells. He's about to get on this ship that's going to take him back to Jerusalem where they're going to put him on trial and then send him to Rome where he's going to die. And here's what he says. He says, remembering the words the Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Okay? Would you just say that with me? Just that last part where it starts, it is more. It is more blessed to give than receive. You've heard that before, haven't you? Let me ask you a question. How many of you said blessed? <laughs> it's not what it says. It just says blessed. But <laughs> I'm serious. I was typing that yesterday. I said, why do I say blessed? It doesn't say blessed. It says it's blessed to give than to receive. So I don't know why we said it, but it's kind of cool. So I like it anyway. So, all right. So, so listen, it's more blessed or blessed to give than to receive. Okay. We've all heard that. Cliché. But listen, I'm teaching this series, and I really want each of you to get it, because honest truth, I am not trying to get anything from you. There'll be some of you will be cynical and say, he's just trying to get more offerings, he's just trying to do this and this. I am honestly not trying to get anything from you. I'm doing this because I want to get something for you. I want you to have something that you don't have now. And I want you to do this. And, and most of us, we would all admit that in the last 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years of doing it our way, We've spent a lot of money that we wish we had back, don't we? We've made some financial decisions that are, we could only describe as crazy, all right? And, and we've done that. And, and so in the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years of doing it your way, we've wasted a lot of money. Like I said, money we'd love to have back. And you'd love to have it back even if you couldn't even spend it on you. You would just say, I'd just like to erase that decision. So I would like to just say real quick, so, so don't do that again the next five years. Don't do that again the next 10 years. Don't do that again the next 20 years. I, I want you to learn to be generous because it's a powerful thing. And my promise to you is that if we learn to be generous as a church and you learn to be generous as people, we will, we, we will give more and it'll just be natural and we'll save more. We'll have more for the future and paying ourselves and we'll spend wisely. And Jesus said, we'll be happier. There'll be more joy in our life. So let me just end today since this is... Um, introduction to this series. Let me end today with this little comparison, okay? Here's what our culture says. Our culture says that when you get paid, however you get your money, spend all, spend all you get. And it's very dangerous. They make it easy with easy credit. Easy credit, right? We spend more than we get. And then be frustrated over what you don't have and hope to hit it big one day in something. And I look back at that and I go, you know, that's crazy. That's crazy to live that way. That's the way I used to live, right? 
But here's what God says. He says, if you're a generous person, you'll give more, you'll save more, you'll consume and waste less. Our culture looks at us and they look at that. You know what they say? That's crazy. That's crazy. So here's my point. Choose your crazy. It's crazy, so choose. Don't let the culture press you into its mold. You get to choose, all right? So I want to challenge you to choose your crazy in this series. I think you're going to enjoy this, all right? I, it's something I enjoy talking about and sharing the blessings of God in my own life in this. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning, for the people that have gathered here, uh, for what this day means to us. We know as believers that literally every Sunday we come together, we're celebrating a risen Savior. We're thankful for the opportunity to sing, to smile, to give each other hugs and handshakes, to enjoy fellowship. I'm thankful for our, uh, our group leaders that are, that are here that are going to be teaching our kids and uh, God, I just uh, pray for those in our church that are not able to be here because of sickness. We have some in the hospital and others that are uh, having physical struggles. God, that you'll just lift them up. I know they're watching. And uh, God, I just pray that you'll wrap your arms of love around them. Um, God, help us to learn to be generous. You were so generous to us. You gave us the very best when we weren't even asking for it. While we were still sinners, you gave your son for us. While we never said thank you, you gave your son for us. And so, God, we just want to learn to be generous. God, you've promised us um, that our lives would be much more joyful, much more happy. God, I believe it's a wise way to live. So, God, help us to choose our crazy and to do it in just the very best way. We're thankful for Jesus today. We pray this in his name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen.